me read from the very beginning of a novel I'm working on. Chapter one. <laughs> they drove all night, pushing north at the interstate, pavement pulling the tires like the valves of a treadmill. The car couldn't go over 70 without rattling, so Eileen kept it there, big rigs bearing down from behind and passing in a swoosh and blast of the horn at a woman alone in the front seat. None of the truckers noticed Jeremy asleep in the back. She could almost forget him herself. He slept so soundly, and when she thought to glance back, she saw only the mound made by the hefty bags he lay against. What could be more ordinary than a mom checking on her sleeping child? Her hands gripped the steering wheel as if negotiating hairpins, though she barely had to steer since the grapevine. Another 50, 70, 100 miles sped by, the needle hovering at a quarter tank, and then it would plummet to empty. Lights up ahead now, too bright for friendly welcome, like the security beams in the lot across the street from Randy's, where she'd rented a bedroom and kitchen privileges for the past year, ever since she'd seen the notice calling for a quiet, responsible, sober roommate, and answered it as though by so doing she would become what was asked for. <laughs> Eileen pulled off the interstate, chose the station with cheaper gas, the kind of responsible decision she'd be making from now on, she told herself. <laughs> Out of the car, she blinked at the cool freshness of the air. More than the flat valley, it told her how far they'd come. And the solid noise of the freeway gave her something to hold on to in the vast darkness. She felt giddy with anonymity. Until she went inside and the door chime bleated her entrance, jerking awake the cashier who scowled from beneath the turban. She dropped a 20 on the counter and back outside filled the tank. Leaving the car at the pumps didn't seem like a good idea, and yet moving the car to the dark area over by the payphones seemed too furtive. So she parked it in front of the store, but away from the cashier's window, and checked that the doors were locked, leaving a back window open a crack. In the restroom, she bent over the sink and squirted the entire bottle of quick tint hair henna over her head. The stuff was surprisingly runny, trickling down her neck and into the sink. She waited what seemed like 10 minutes, and then rinsed, pressed paper towels to her scalp, stood up. The towels came away damp and stained the color of dry blood. A knock came at the door, and she froze. The doorknob rattled. Just hold on, I'll be right out. Did the guy even speak English? With manicure scissors from her purse, she went to work on her rock star flyaway shag. The blades pulled and sawed as much as cut, until her hair was the shortest it had been since third grade, when she wanted a Dorothy Hamill wedge, and Viv had insisted she could do as good a job as any salon. Another knock, louder. Eileen mopped up, hair sticking to her damp wrists and sleeves. She flushed the toilet twice, killed the light, opened the door. Jeremy, squirming, had his legs crossed. I have to go. Don't ever leave the car without asking me. She grabbed his shoulder and he flinched. I've told you that before. Had she? Beyond the shelves of potato chips, the turban the cashier stared. Jeremy looked up, a quiver working his brow. And then the skin over his eyes smoothed out, holding no sign of what had flickered there. And he walked into the restroom. She heard the bolt being thrown. The cashier looked away. She forced a, what are you going to do, smile, kids. She turned to the long wall of soft drinks and beer, shelves and shelves of beer, bottles glistening brown and green and clear, Hands, too, shiny and metallic. She could feel their sweat against her palm. She walked past them all, as though walking past the kids who taunted her in seventh grade and chose an orange soda, the bright bubbled logo, innocent and without association. I'll take this, she told the cashier, who wouldn't look at her, and a packet of beef jerky. Kids eat so much junk these days, you know? Outside, rosy light flatlined the eastern horizon. A ball of panic burst in her chest, spread to a full body shudder. The sun was rising. Day would extinguish darkness. Another 50 or so miles of I-5, and then a new freeway. This one west toward Lincoln and their new life. What happened to your hair? God, you scared me. Don't sneak up like that, OK? She held out the soda with one hand, rubbed the newly bare back of her neck with the other. You like it? He said nothing and climbed in the back seat with the hefty bags. I don't bite, you know. The soda's not poison. Had he even heard? 
Did she have any idea how much she, did he have any idea how much she cared? She pulled the tab on the soda, drank so fast that fizz went up her nose. Once, Jeremy had clung to her ankles every time she left him with Viv. He clung and cried, and it had felt good, someone caring enough about her to make such a fuss. She had loved the drama of dropping by unannounced to surprise him and see him drop his toy and run to her, Viv looking sour. Back on the interstate, Eileen took the very next exit, this one a small two-lane highway, climbing the coastal range and coming down south of San Francisco. They'd arrive in Rincon from the south, not the east, a small change, yet one that she alone had decided. For years, others had made all the choices, Viv, the lawyers, Nick. For years, she'd left them, not anymore. Any time her older cousin Gary had written on a birthday card, a card Eileen had kept in her purse for months, any time you need a change of pace, come visit Rincon. Mi casa es su casa. At first, the idea had seemed crazy, impossible. Yeah, she and Gary had played doctor as, a kid, as kids and gotten high together as teenagers, and she'd blown a friend of his in the backseat on the way home from a heart concert, but she'd seen him only once in the past decade. He'd done well with the chain of hardware stores he owned. The whole family knew it, the way he sent $100 bills at Christmas. This family doesn't need handouts, Viv grumbled. But that wasn't how Eileen saw it. To her, Gary had gotten out, and more power to him. Out of the crowd of little houses, once tidy and well-kept, and now in one of the roughest parts of Burbank. Out of the suffocating family ruled by Viv and Viv's sister, Helen, Gary's mother. Even in high school, Gary had saved up to buy an old BMW, the only imported car in a family where a nice car meant a cutlass, giving himself airs, Viv had said. But the idea wouldn't quit. Every Thursday and Sunday, when Eileen showed up at her mother's house and rang the doorbell to pick up her own son, she thought of it. Jeremy no longer ran to meet her, but stood, obedient, next to Viv with the closed screen door behind them, the same, the same screen door Eileen had tried to peer through that time, Viv wouldn't even let her see him. She couldn't remember the last time she'd been on the house side of that door. She thought of the idea, too, whenever Randy asked her, so when are you going to get custody? And when, one Thursday, after hellish traffic, she pulled up to the curb 30 minutes late to see Viv shaking her head, but secretly, Eileen thought, please. The agreement, Leany, as though Eileen needed a reminder, laid twice in a row is the kind of thing the court will notice. Wait here. Viv produced Jeremy five minutes later, pressing her arthritic hand between his shoulder blades. There you go, honey. Your mother's here to see you. Thank you. Thank you.